pesto, which uh, is actually of the wild area behind your H2O center because we have very a very dear friend who lives just down the block. And I spend a lot of time walking around there and up Mission Creek all the time. So I do have some beautiful, beautiful images of um, Kelowna in my, my repertoire here. So I'm going to give you uh, a little demo of the process, one of the processes, like I approach painting in various different ways at various different times, but this is a very tried and true and um, easy way to do a really solid little pastel. So how many people have had any experience with pastel? Anybody? Okay, Jimmy, okay, Audrey. Great, okay. So you're, some of you are a little familiar with the medium. It's got its drawbacks. Uh, it's very unfortunate that it's not well understood in Western Canada, unfortunately. Um, if you're a member of the American Pastel Society or the Red Earth Society or anywhere on the Eastern Seaboard, there's tons of um, pastel groups and it's a very active, active um, clubs, very active clubs. But out here, not so much. I've been doing them since I got my first set of pastels from my father, who used to be the head of drafting for Mobile Oil. And one day he came home with this set of Faber Castell, similar to new pastels, kind of hard pastels, but fabulous wooden box with all oh, this, this rainbow of colors. And I fell in love then, and I've been in love with them ever since. Since then, of course, I've discovered all the other brands of pastels and eventually ended up, I make most of my pastels that I use. I really like my homemade ones the best. Um, and the same with paper. I'm never really very satisfied with the paper that you buy. Uh, there's UART and some of these very high-end papers out there that you have to sell your firstborn to actually afford them. So mm -hmm. I make my own papers too. So here's an example. And what's really nice about making your own papers is you make your own colors. So I tint them all different colors depending on what my painting is going to be. I usually work on a mid-valued paper. I'm not really fond of super light or super dark. I like them in the mid-value range. Another process that I do is I do work on a white sheet and I underpaint. But today I'm gonna to start on a tone piece, but I am still underpainting. And I'm going to use just a little spray bottle of rubbing alcohol. So rubbing alcohol does a great job of melting the chalk. It just turns it into paint basically. But what it does is it adheres it to the paper so that it doesn't move again. It's on there solid. So you can at least establish your value pattern of your piece, which is very important to me. So you've got your darks where you want your darks. And then you go back in and you start building your pastel. My process is basically general to specific. So I start with big shapes and I work up to my little shapes. Um, uh, it's uh, with my acrylic work and my mixed media work, I'm a bit more abstracted. When I get to my pastels, I'm quite realistic. My background training, I was an advertising artist a uh, visual communicator for many years, worked in advertising agencies, doing illustrations, brochure design, all that kind of stuff. So I was quite classically trained. Um, I have drawing skills and all that stuff that I could ever want. So um, I can do that if I want, but I've chosen to go more abstracted with my work. When I get to those pastels, they're still pretty impressionistic and still pretty realistic. So you're gonna see that side of Susan tonight because there's that side of Susan and there's that side of Susan. So I'm gonna be <laughs> doing this. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna turn you around to the working area here. And so this is uh, where I'm gonna be doing the work. And my pad has decided to be a little bit wonky. Just hold on, I'll just fix that. All right, okay. So you can see that I've got my, um, this is my reference photo that I'm gonna to use tonight. One of the things that I look for when I'm looking for my reference photos is I'm looking for interesting light patterns. I'm looking for good darks and lights. Um, I'm looking for texture. I'm a big person on foregrounds. I love foregrounds. Uh, 
skies don't play that big of a, uh, a, a important part of my paintings usually, unless it's all about the sky. And if I'm doing that, I'm usually in, in acrylic because I find that skies can look a little bit cliche in my world. So I like to stay more with the foregrounds here. So here's my paper here. This is a little piece of paper that I made today. And over here, I have another piece that's similar, a little bit darker in value, but um, I'm just will show you some techniques and ways that I actually uh, use the chalk that I'm going to apply to my surface here. So some of the things, chalk all has different um, hardnesses. So like this little guy here, this is a really cheap little chalk and it goes on pretty good, but it's, it's quite um, hard to get it on the surface. Whereas if I have one of my homemades, similar color, but when I put this on, it just goes on just like really intense, really fills in the tooth. And it's a, a really um, uh, buttery, creamy kind of finish. Uh, when you're doing your pastel, one of the rules is much like oil. It's uh, light, hard, and then you can work up to your with your softer pastels. But you can't go back. You can't put this on top of this because it really kind of digs into the pastel. So one of the rules is you start out with your... Um, harder pastels and you build to your softer pastels. Some of the different brands that I like, um, Unison is lovely. This set uh, I bought on sale, it was only $600 um, and it's been well used. And the other one is um, Diane Townsend, uh, her tirage are really beautiful. They have a lot of grit in them. So they just really peel off these things just like beautifully. Like they just, they're, they're just lovely to use. So I have a, use a combination of these kind of things and my homemades. And I started making them because one of the things you don't get with bought pastels is some of these really like um, gentle colors. It's sometimes very hard to find subtle violets, like just really light, very pale violets. So I started making my own pastels so I could get that range of color that I was looking for. And um, they're not hard to make actually, they're just a combination of calcium carbonate, uh, some uh, pigment, uh, powdered pigment, which I buy a lot of, my, all my earth tones I get at, um, uh, uh, my brain's just gone dead, Ceramics Canada, which also sells me my French talc, which is my binder, my calcium carbonate, which is the, the body of the pastel, and a little bit of French uh, china clay, which gives them a little bit more hardness if you want a little harder chalk. So I buy most of my supplies from them. And then the remainder of the colors I will buy from either a pigment house or I'll go online and find them. They range in price. Uh, some of your colors like ultramarine blue is very reasonable. Uh, I don't actually use things like cadmium red. I used to make cadmium red pastels, but I think they might be just a little too dangerous. So I've kind of quit doing that. So um, I'm not in the business now. I don't do a lot of pastel making. I basically have enough pastels to last me till I'm long gone. <laughs> so um, I've given up on that. So the thing I do to begin with is Susan. Um, yes. Susan, all right. Uh, did you say are these soft pastels or oil pastels? Yes. No, soft they're pastels. soft chalk. They're they're soft chalk pastels. Okay. And, and that the, did you paint onto that paper? Is that a acrylic paint or what have you put on there? On this, this, yeah. this. Okay, I'll show you what I do. So you need grit. So if you can hear it, you hear it? It's got sort of a, a gritty surface. So you need something for the pastel to, to nestle into, just a piece of paper. The pastel is gonna just fall right off, right? So, and you can't build on a smooth piece of paper. There's just nothing to hold it. So you have to create a tooth. So when you go out, you find papers like you Art, um, who else is a maker? Uh, Winsor & Newton makes a, a paper that's actually cork. It's colored cork that's sprayed onto a surface. Like there's a few different varieties. Yes? 
There's the pastel mat, and I think there's Wallace also makes a paper. Uh -huh. Well, I have, you know, I haven't been able to find Wallace for quite a while. Maybe they're back in business and pastel mat. Yes, absolutely. That's another one, but they're hideously expensive. And like this sheet of paper that I made here is less than $2. You know, it's very, very reasonable. So I start out with this uh, Liquitex clear gesso. It has to be the clear gesso. If you're looking at gesso gesso, that's not going to work because this has got tooth. It's got a lot of tooth to it. Um, there's a pastel ground you can buy from Golden, but I, I prefer this. And then I mix it with um, some white gesso or black gesso, depending on the color. So this one I made today, or this one here, this would have had a combination of a clear gesso, a little bit of white gesso and a little bit of black gesso and there's a little bit of yellow in here. So it's kind of a taupey color. And I put it on with either one of these things. Uh, let's see if I got one here. What paper do you uh, put it on to? I put it on to a Bristol paper. So I'm very fond of this guy right here. The Canson uh, Recycled Bristol Paper. Uh, it's got a very smooth surface. So you can't be putting this on a uh, watercolor paper. Like a cold press watercolor paper, you would be wasting the paper and wasting your medium. So I use the Canson. I buy different sizes pads, like this is the 14 by 17, but they also have a smaller pad that you can use. And honestly, I very seldom do anything uh, bigger than that. Also, if I want to work really large, I'll just get a very smooth piece of illustration board that's got some weight to it. You can mount this absolutely before you paint on it. I wouldn't try mounting it after because that would be a very messy business, but you could mount this paper onto some sort of surface. I've just got a piece of cardboard back here, just a little bit of softness instead of on this really hard board here. This just gives a little bit and just makes it a little bit of an easier experience when you're you're actually painting. So what I apply it with, and I don't know where my big one's gone. Oh, here's a medium sized one. Is I put it on with one of these things like this. And then I take a soft brush like one of these. Okay. And then I just kind of smooth it out just a little bit, very, very lightly, just a gentle touch after I put it on with one of these. And I'm not worried if I get some variation in the process of putting it down, but that doesn't matter because it's going to be covered up. What you want is to get this lovely surface that's going to hold your pastel onto the paper. Um, if you really want even a smoother surface, you want it to, I can make this feel like you're, you, you are. All I have to do is take a very fine piece of um, uh, sandpaper and just give it a very 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 light little sand and that just absolutely smooths it out but usually I'm pretty good with just this so I've been making paper I uh, there's also other recipes I used to use uh, volcanic ash which I would pick up at ceramics Canada mixed with gesso two parts gesso to one part ceramic uh, volcanic ash and then add your color in Usually I work with gessos when I'm coloring my, my um, surface, simply because you won't get a shine. And I've lost my gessos. I buy the Holbein gessos. I have, uh, I've got just regular white gesso, regular black gesso. Then I have a red oxide. I have a, uh, a uh, this is yellow ochre. So very little involved once you got your supplies. Yes? Oh, okay. All right, so any other questions on the surface? So you don't need um, to do any ash, just the gesso is good enough to give you that rough texture? Absolutely, all you need is this. So this surface was a little bit of, uh, oh, probably two tablespoons of this, a tablespoon of gesso, white gesso, um, tablespoon of yellow gesso 
and a, a little smattering of black because this isn't it would be brighter yellow than this I didn't want it to be really super bright and then just mix it up and then just put it on here brush it back to get a nice little bit smoother surface and you're good to go so when I make it what I usually do is I'll make up a color in a little tray and I save all my uh, styrofoam trays meat trays and vegetables that come on trays peppers and things and I use those for making my mediums on, then I just check them out when I'm finished. And I usually start with one color and then I'll add a little bit more black to make some darker colors, or I might add a little bit more light or a little bit more uh, burnt sienna or something to warm it up. And I'll make a, a variety of colors in one setting, in one sitting, so that I've got lots of different colors. And I've chosen this one here because I really see a lot of this sort of, you know, yellowy green that's sort of playing throughout here. And you see it along the edge of these trees here. So I think this is a really nice base color to start with. Now I'm going to, in a second here, pick out my darks with my uh, alcohol and some very, uh, very light chalk on the surface. So I don't wanna have the chalk on too thick because I don't wanna have, you can get out of hand with it. So I'm just gonna do it very, very lightly. So here I go. I'm gonna just pick out a couple colors here. Uh, that one should do her. So I've got a little bit of black here for that, the darkness, the dark areas. I got a little bit of grape, a little bit, this is a homemade, it's a mixed color because I see a lot of violet happening in the darks here. So I'm going to go with this kind of background for the darks. It'll also be a great foil for some of these greens uh, because red violet is sort of opposite of yellow green. So it'll add a little bit of energy in the form of simultaneous contrast. So here we go. So just, I'm just going to do just very lightly, just very, not very much on here, just, just gonna, and just follow the, where my darks are gonna go, okay? I'm not gonna put it where my lights are for now. I'm just gonna just, so you can see a lot of that color still coming through. I'm not hitting it really hard. So the thing about pastel, one of the things, oh, I hold it so lightly, I lose it, there we go. Um, one of the things about pastel is it's much like playing an instrument. You don't play it all at the same um, weight of your hand. You have to use it lightly, aggressively, or you're going to have problems creating interest in your painting. So just, just we're going to make this a little darker. We're going to add a little bit of a bit more violet in here, a little bit darker. And then I'm going to hit it really, really dark, just on the edges here. So I'm just building up this surface. And of course, I'm going to melt this in. And once it's melted in, it's not going to move again. It's just going to be this dark pattern that I have created on this surface. So not one solid color. I'm just, I'm playing with these three colors to make a little bit of variety in here. And it's really dark in here. So what I'm doing is where I want my lightest lights, I'm not going to apply anything. It's going to remain just, just the paper. And some of these middle values, if this becomes a little bit colored, that's okay. But I'm going to try to maintain some of that. Now what I do is I just take a brush. Now don't use expensive brushes doing this because the paper is incredibly gritty and it wears your brushes out in a heartbeat. So do this with um, cheaper brushes like good old Michaels or I get these sets. These come in sets of I think six. They're really quite lovely brushes from the dollar store for three bucks. Like I don't know how they make them for three bucks. I know child labor. Oh well I'm a bad person. Okay so I'm going to start with some of my lighter colors. So I'm just going to spray this guy up here, a little bit of here. Now it's going to instantly go darker. Okay, that's okay. Because it'll dry up again. Okay. And I'm just going to come in here. 
and it dries really fast. So you don't have to wait long for this to, um, can't do this, I gotta do this. Okay, now you don't wanna linger long on here because it will start to, to melt your, your gesso base because of course, um, uh, gesso is, can be, well, acrylic paint can be wetted or uh, re, reconstituted with, with uh, alcohol. So if you get it on your clothes, just take a little scrubby with a little bit of alcohol and you can clean it up. So, so what is that alcohol again, Susan? It's just sort of a... It's just isopropyl alcohol from the drugstore. Okay. Yeah, nothing special, just... Just gonna change up my brush, get a, another brush here. Just gonna just, just in there a little bit. And melt that down. So this creates my underpainting. Susan, is there any odor to that? Like, oh, is it no, not really. Okay. As long as I don't spray it in my face and it dries really fast. Like this is already dry up here, right? right. This yeah. is already done. So you don't have to sit around waiting for paint to dry. I mean, if you spray it right at your face, you're certainly going to smell it and feel it, mm -hmm. but um, not, not here. It doesn't. Okay. So there we go. So there's my underpainting already on my surface here. Now, the nice thing about this is, I'll just show you here. Oh, my hand's wet, that's not a good plan. Okay, so where I've used this here, I go like this and I get just, just, I might get just a little hint, but basically it's stuck on there. It's not gonna go anywhere. So when I work on top of this, it, it will be great. It'll just sit there like that. Okay, so. There we go. Can I so, just ask how you clean those brushes then? Just water. Use, just water just works. Water. Okay. Yeah, because rubbing alcohol is, you know, it's going to clean with water. So the second thing I'm going to show you just over here is if you make a mistake on your painting and you want to get back to this surface, to the base surface that you started with, all you need is a piece of white bread. So this is just really nasty white bread, you know, like your cheapest white bread you can get. Don't get any artisanal grainy breads. That's not going to work. But just a piece of white bread and you can, and it, it acts as a really nice eraser for your paper. So, you know, if you, you and it's, it's a lot safer than trying to rub it off with a brush and blow because this, uh, you know, it's got a little bit of moisture in it and it grabs the pastel and it just ends up falling down in a very um, unthreatening way. So if you make a mistake and you wanna clean it up, just a piece of bread. Some colors like this red have stained the paper just a wee bit, but it's gone now, you know, like this is, there's nothing on here that I can move around. So if you've worked an area up and you're just really, really desperately unhappy with it, you can always go in with a piece of bread. So you can see this is sort of dried up and, um, you know, we've got this going on. So see how I can, I can go like this and it's not moving. It's on the paper. It's adhered to the paper. So that is uh, one way of uh, creating a painting surface for your pastel that uh, allows you to get your value pattern, your darks, you know, your darks here these darks down here on your surface immediately. And I've chosen these colors because I want those colors to kind of um, sparkle through the other colors that I'm going to use. So for this one, I'm probably gonna do it pretty realistically because I'm, that's what I usually do, as opposed to being creative and using interesting colors like I do with my acrylic. Doesn't sound like I like myself when I paint pastel, does it? I do. I really do. 
Okay, so I'm just picking out a few here. So I'll be using lots of neutral dark greens. And one of my favorite trays, like I have many, so this is this is my tray of pastels. And I gotta say, it's a little bit messed up right now, but it goes from my lighter blues to my darker blues, my light yellows to my <laughs> mid greens to my dark greens, um, brighter pinks and stuff down to my darker ones. And then I also have one of neutrals. So neutrals are really important. So these are just neutral light colors and neutral dark colors that I use in my painting. Okay. So if you're inclined to do so, if you're going to use a harder chalk, like a new pastel, and I do love my new pastels, these guys here. Have you tipped again? Oh. Hold on, I gotta, I'm gonna have to put a wedgie of something in here because it's dry. Shouldn't be doing that. Didn't do that this morning. Oh. oh, good Lord. Okay, don't touch, Susan, don't touch. Okay, here's my, here's my new pastels. I like this set here. Um, it's got two layers and I'm going to use this really dark green, I think, in the process in one of my, my layers. And this dusty rose here. I think we'll get that going in. Okay. So delivering the surface or delivering the chalk to the surface your first layer or your first go at the surface, you try to be quite delicate and not deliver too much chalk because once you fill up the, the pastel with too much pastel, you can't work it anymore and it becomes very, very difficult. So I'm going to go in just very, very gently here. This is quite a nice neutral. And I'm just gonna just start, because I like how, now here's some different movements. This is, you know, if you've got, get a new set of pastels and it's got paper on it, take the paper off. This, that paper is not gonna work for you. You gotta have the ability to use the side of your chalk, the edge of your chalk, the end of your chalk. So I'm just coming in here and just, just establishing some of these warmer, lighter colors. And we'll just, you know, just a little bit over here. Putting on a little bit heavier here, because I feel that, I feel that. And then I've got this color coming down here like this. And then, so it's just sort of a scribbly motion. Like I said earlier, this is the whole process is general to specific. So right now I'm just establishing some of my values, some of the warmth in the painting. And I'm just gonna just, Okay, now I'm gonna come back in with a nice neutral. This is a, a very grayed green. And I'm gonna come in here. Now, again, this is a, quite a soft chalk. So I'm putting it on quite delicately because I, if I press too hard, I'm, gonna do, I'm just gonna lay down way too much chalk. So just a very light, this. I'm just going to have it a little darker here. So no specifics at this point. It's just very generalized. Very, very generalized. And we'll just come in here and sometimes I use a, a stumbling kind of action here if I want a little more texture showing up. We can go in there and develop some of the darker colors in there later. Um, I'm not gonna push that right at the moment. And we'll come down and find some of these uh, deeper 
Richard Green's in here. So not with that one because it's got too many bits and pieces in it. Okay, here we go. So I'm just going to come in here with this. Now that's this is going to be just the first pass. I'm not going to leave that like that. That's too abrupt, too aggressive. So I'm going to come in with just a little bit lighter color and blend that in. Or a little bit more, um, a little different green. Let's put it that way. Green gray. Let's see. Yeah, that's a little softer. And at any time I want to uh, push that violet again, I'm just taking this little harder chalk and I'm just blending those colors together like that. And coming up here. So sometimes color isn't what you think it is. It's, it's a combination of things that don't seem to make any sense, but actually work out very nicely. A little bit of dark right down here. Just, of course, dark things anchor painting. Um, your lighter colors go back into space. Going to warm up some of these areas now. And pastels, the person with the biggest set wins. Okay, just remember that. It's, uh, you got 52 shades of something. Excellent, because you're always looking for that one more color. Hence, I make these things. And when I have workshops and people are making their own pastels, it's quite the phenomenon to watch because it'll be lunchtime. Everyone's got sweat, sweat dripping off their brow. And you say, okay, it's lunchtime. And everybody's like, you know, I got to make this one more color. I, I just, I got to get this done. So people get quite, what's the word? passionate about the whole affair. And it's a really fun way. Sorry, I'm just looking for something. It's a really fun way to learn how to create color because you make this array, you start with one color and you expand it out both ways to darker values and lighter values. And it's really quite fun. Okay, so this is, um, you know, uh, I'm looking at some of this stuff here, okay? So I'm going to just come in here. I'm not going to be real specific. I'm going to do more of a scumbling action here, just to begin with. And I'm just sort of dancing my chalk around. Now this is just going to be my base color. This is in the shadows, so it's cooler. As I move towards the light, I'll warm it up. Now this should have been a little bit darker right in here. So I can at any time take a little bit of this and you know you can get pretty specific with that area. I can just come in here and say okay I didn't want that really light there so mm -hmm. let's just fix that. Okay that'll dry up and then I can just work back into that area. So it's quite a versatile surface to play on. Okay. So I'm just going to play up the um, this warmth in here. I'm just going to darken it and warm it up just a little bit here, just where the sun is kind of hitting it. And then I'm going to come in here like this. So my one rule is air to the dark. It's much easier to lighten them up than it is to try to get that dark value back. So I always kind of push this really um, dark value pattern. And then I bring the lights back out again. So let's see if that's, uh, no, nope, not warm enough, not yellow enough. Just looking, this is one of those hunt and seek things. Let's see. Nope, not warm enough. Okay, Susan, so get serious here. How about this? Ooh, that I like. Okay, so I'm gonna come in here and start. This is sort of my focal point, is right about here. So I want this to really pop out. So we're gonna just come in here. And, 
And sometimes you have to make colors so you don't get the color you want right away. So I'm starting out with this sort of yellowy green and then I can put a little bit more warmth on top of it if I want to just add a little bit more warmth. So just a little bit of there, that there, and then this sort of comes forward. So again, I'm still not, I'm still not doing anything really uh, specific yet. I'm just building, 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 building. There's gonna be some light down here. This is gonna come through here and then it gets quite warm. So I'm gonna take um, a nice little piece of this chalk here. That's a little bit too yellow. How about this one? Oh, this one would be perfect. Okay, here's this color here. Okay, we're just... So I'm gonna leave my lightest lights right after I've built everything else up. Okay, so we're gonna come in here, we're gonna come down, and then it gets quite warm, sort of orangey, goldy colored in here. So we're just gonna just bring this in. And again, also I do sort of a pointillist kind of movement where it's just, you're just barely touching that surface. And you're just working that in here like this, come down. Just pick out some of these, maybe a little bit of light over there, just to balance it. And as it moves over here into this area, it almost gets orange. So we'll just pick up this nice little orange pastel here. And we'll, nope, that's not orange enough. Mm, okay. No, okay, here's, here we go. There, that's good. Okay, I'm just gonna just, so lots of colors are dancing around in here. And then every once in a while, you just use the edge, the, the tip of it. So I'm just getting some lines happening in here. I'm just, just playing that color. And I'll put some of these color notes like that one and that one in as it develops. Okay, so again, when you squint, you're gonna start seeing these patterns that I'm, I'm working on just in value. I'm not concerned about the detail, like I said earlier. This isn't about the detail at the moment. It's just about creating some patterns of value here. So the whole process is made up of big marks and little marks, um, soft marks and hard marks. And I'm gonna come in here and just put a little bit of this uh, rose color in amongst things. This will create a little bit of um, simultaneous contrast with the violets and the yellows and the greens. And just give it a little bit of a pump of color here. Okay, so step back, take a look at it, see uh, where you want to maybe change the, the temperature. And I do want to change the temperature here just a little bit more. So I'm gonna come in here with this guy here and we're gonna change that temperature just a little bit. A little bit of scumbling over what's already there. And that's okay, scumbling is a good thing. Okay, just, so it's this development of the, this surface. It's, for me, it's, it's the um, texture that you create, it's the, the subtleties and, and there is no, you know, um, how you use your color. Sometimes it's not what you think you should be doing. So you wouldn't think, well, I need to put 
purple in there. Well, purple actually is a big player in this particular one. Okay, so this, this surface here is starting to build. Um, I always work from dark and I bring up the lights. That's just a, I think my peculiarity, however you say that word. Okay, now there's a lot of light right in here. So we're just gonna come in. Because I haven't really oozed this really hard yet, or I've, I've been dancing on the surface, I've still got room to put things. Okay, so I can really still get a little bit of pastel on there. Okay. And we'll have that little shot of orange. Let's find a nice deep, here's a nice little deep orange. We're gonna find a couple little spots of this orange that are playing in the foreground here. I wouldn't put these in the background. They're way too forward, but they'll add a nice little interest. Now I'm gonna come in with some lights for that sky. So I want something that's pretty neutral. Um, so I'm gonna go in with, I think, uh, a very soft, pale yellow. Let's see what this looks like. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. And then that distant hill will be in a very pale violet. So we're gonna have that lovely violet hill and we'll have this lovely pale sky. So now I'm just doing negative space painting. Up until now, I haven't really been doing any negative space, but now it's gonna play a major role in what I do. So now I start coming in here and I start creating those shapes of the tree line, the branches. You know, just playing in there like that. Now, these, these are very soft, so they have no problem going on top. Now, some people like working on a dark uh, black background, and I feel that that kills a lot of color, even though that, you know, it's very dramatic, but it kills color. So I never use black. It's always a color that I've made. Okay, now I'm going to bring in this, this, this lovely hill here. So we'll just we'll pick him out. We'll pick it back into here a little bit. here and then again just start forming the tree forms here and I can come back and work back out too with these so in here I'm going to just find some of these any questions we're, we're still here okay good <laughs> nobody's it's gone incredible <laughs> it really Time's looks up. fabulous I love the sky. Wow. Yeah, just, just, yeah, it's, it always is amazing. <laughs> One minute it's not there and it's like, boom, I'm here. So we'll just keep. And you can simplify, you can add as many branches, take branches out. So I'm just, you know, I'm just creating that tree by picking out shapes <laughs> around it. Okay. So in painting, using negative space is as important as using your positive, okay? You've got to have a handle on how to create shapes by painting around the shape, basically. So I'm painting around the shape of the trees, right? I'm not painting the trees, I'm painting around the trees. A great way to practice this is to do reductive drawing where you start with a completely black sheet and then you mm -hmm. pick your light back out. So uh, that is just really fun to do. Find a really nice black and white photograph you like and um, start it out as a pure black and find your lights. And you will be, mm -hmm. you will be doing um, reductive drawing.
Okay. So now I want to really get that light happening in there. So again, I always work up to my lightest lights. So, and I'm also going to find a little bit of, here's a beautiful um, acid green. This is a homemade one. I'm just gonna just find some of that real intense green that's just playing along the edge there. Just push that in there. And I'm not gonna put that anywhere else. I mean, that green's gonna sit in here maybe a couple little dots just coming down, but I'm not gonna overdo it because I want to maintain that, that energy right there. Um, come in with a little bit of, oh, you should always put your crayons out that you use so you know what you got instead of like me. That's okay. Um, no, I just wanna find, now I'm doing this very, not as as especially careful as I should, but so I'm just going to just just find a little bit of light through here, and there's a little bit of light that kind of plays through the the trees. The voice. And I'm going to come back up here and just warm that up a little bit. Just quite a bit of light right through here on this tree. So I'm just going to just. And if you want to get your fingers in there, and that's what everybody wants to do, I highly recommend you don't. So if I want to blend your color, I just use a stick and I go like this. Wow. It's soft and it. it removes a little of the excess chalk and it just blends the edges just a little bit. If you get your finger in here, it makes it all too soft and icky. That's the only way I can describe it. Icky. Okay. Mm. So it's just. Okay. So. I've got that one lone tree that's sort of sitting up the side of the painting here. And a little bit more, I want just a little bit more of the warmth. Just so this is just, let me just bring this tree out this a little bit, just in sort of this cool mauve kind of color here. And maybe we'll find just a little bit of the tree as it comes down. Just always just a little bit of adjustment here, a little bit of adjustment there. Hmm. All right. So, and step back from your work. I'm not stepping back here because I'd fall on this thing and you'd fall over and I'd just make a horrible mess. So I'm not stepping back, but I'm looking at this going, okay, you need to, find a little break in here. This little edge here is a little bit abrupt and maybe bring some warmth down in here. Just a little bit of warmth here. And now I have to come in with some of this, um, this dark green in the foreground to pick up some of these um, grasses and things. So I'm just gonna come in here like this. And we'll just, just play up a little bit of green shapes, just. You make it look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. been a few pastels on this uh, easel. Okay, and I'm just gonna just. <laughs> just gonna do my little. I took a course from a fellow by the name of Casey Klon. It was my very first Zoom class, and I think it was his very first Zoom class too. Um, and he's a colorist. His sense of color is divine. You can look him up. He's got the order of, I don't know what, like he's quite a well-known famous pastel artist in the States. Um, and his uh, 
sense of color is phenomenal, but he's, he's quite abstract, which I've always um, tried to attain, but you know, you can't, sometimes you just have to do what you do, you know? So I, I will one day be as abstract as him, but it's not gonna be too long. <laughs> what was and his last name again? It's Casey Klon, K-H-L-A-N. And he is just, he's, he's quite the character and he is just a beautiful pastel artist and very eccentric, I love it. I aspire to being as eccentric as he is. I'm just gonna bring in this, I love this little bit of this hill right in here that I wanna just, a little bit stronger in here. You know, and you can dress it up, you can make it as detailed as you want. Now I've got all these, all this detail in the foreground that I have to now address. So I'm gonna get some of these lovely, um, and I can, I don't have to address any of them. If I want to leave it very simple, that could be another um, alternative to the the whole affair. I don't have to do anything. I'm the master of my universe. Anyway, <laughs> I want to just maybe just attempt to get a little bit of this, just a little bit of this guy in here. Just so some of the like this is the paper down here, and it actually works in there rather well. I don't need to to do much. I want to bring a little bit of this purple back into these darks, so I'm going to scumble it in. And then take my little stick, do a little blending. And then I'm going to just start putting those little fluff balls in that are everywhere. This was obviously fall when we went walking. I think it was the end of August, actually. Just I had just taught at um, Gibson's, at the Gibson School of Art, and we were coming back. And we always stop in Kelowna, stay with Ronnie. So There's just a chat that's come through from Audrey Kroll saying, I think we are all mesmerized and I, I absolutely <laughs> agree. It just mm -hmm. putting in the sky in the background, just all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that, isn't that amazing how just negative space is so powerful. If you can learn how to use negative space, it can just make your paintings dance. Um, so you have to not think of the positive shape all the time. You got to think of, um, train yourself how to do it. And like I said, uh, start with a, get a piece of uh, good old fashioned charcoal and just use the side, cover a sheet, use your hand, rub it in so it's nice and even, and then get a good eraser and start picking out the lights that you see in a photograph. So you can't, you can no longer, it's not recognizable per se. It's not like you can see mm -hmm. your object because you're not looking at objects you're looking at spaces around and it teaches you a, a, a myriad of things uh, one of them being every shape has a shape around it and that mm -hmm. is as important as the shape itself and people get and sometimes it's the only way to get the shape to work is by using that negative space um, bits. Okay, so now I can come back in here. Now I can hit it with a little bit of dark and just pick up a few more, a few of those darks that are um, happening here and there that I want to just maybe I've lost or I've overdone. So again, I'm just going to come in with just a little bit of negative space stuff and just find a few of them. Don't overdo it. Um, I'm not, I don't have any tendency to intention to, you know, over, over paint too much. I think this here needs a little bit of darkness. 
you'll know when you're getting too much pastel on, all of a sudden it's just not holding on. And it means you've already got too much on there. And you've got two options at that point. You can either take your bread, pick back a little bit to, so that you can um, reapply um, or start over. And that's always an option. Okay. Oh, she's getting that dreaded finger in there. <laughs> I don't want to make these trees really, I want to make them a colorful color. So I'm putting them in, in a bit of mauve, just, just a little bit softer color. Uh, trouble with I picked a picture that's a little bit complicated and doing it rather small so my bad okay just we hit those now right now I've got this you know there's this, there's all this color around it and all this stuff happening but I do have a little mat here so in a couple minutes I'll just show you I don't know what am I doing for time anyway. Oh, oh, you're good. You you put it up to another half an hour. Holy cow! Got time to hold do a whole new one. <laughs> Not quite. No. <laughs> Let's find a couple little dark shapes here. I'm gonna break up this shape just a little bit. It's a little solid looking, and I don't want that to be so solid. Um, I think I just heard a robin. Oh, spring has just been brutal here. It does <laughs> not want to show up. It's just fighting. You're you're in Calgary, correct? No, I'm in Red Deer, just north of Calgary, mm. halfway between Edmonton and Calgary. is the city of Red Deer. Just adding a little bit of a little bit of life down here. Maybe I'll put a little bit of move just in there to be step back. Ah. And quite often the trees will be quite light at the top and get darker because simply because the light is, you know, sort of uh, filtering through from the top. That's another way to blend is just to um, take your crayon and stumble over an area. It just softened that green down just a little bit, made it a little bit more, uh, a little subtler. Mm. Okay. These little puffball things, you know, that sometimes it's the devil at the detail and the devil's in the detail where you mess up a perfectly good painting by getting too specific. <laughs> Anybody else do that? <laughs> yes. Yep. And something's working pretty good. And then all of a sudden it's like, what happened? Happens to everybody. Even the best <laughs> have, have piles of rejection. Okay. Mm. Let's just come in with just a few. Now, if you're doing any major lines like uh, like this, you can get very fine lines with these big, big crayons by just turning as you're putting the line on. Mm -hmm. You're constantly changing your edge. If you don't change your edge, it just gets thicker and thicker. And you just get this unsightly 
thing happening. So it's, it's really about how you hold the crayon and how you administer it to the surface. Mm. Oh boy, what's, what's this? I've got this desire to put some orange on there. Um, <laughs> just a little bit brighter though, not quite so dark as that. Uh, let's see. Oh, how about this? Oh, this looks like no, this looks like the ticket. I need just a little bit of intensity. Like always start your, don't put your strongest colors on right away, kind of build up to them. So you noticed I didn't put that bright yellow green on right away. It sort of went in at the end. And now I'm just putting a little bit of this really hot yellow orange on at the end. You sort of have to, like I say, it's a building process. Mm -hmm. It's not, and this is how I paint too. I mean, my my process of painting is very similar to this, general to specific, building uh, the surface, developing it, not getting too particular about anything. And I'm really not thinking about this being grasses or these being thistles. It's more about, oh, those are little light shapes and those are darker shapes. And I'm just looking at them more or less as shapes. Those things are the, uh, ooh, where is it? Is that the kind of green I want? Oh, that's good. That'll do. Okay. Just a few. Okay. We are going to stop pretty soon because I don't want to just keep one more pastel on here. It's not necessary. So just, you know, find the shapes, pick the shapes, and see how it looks when you throw a mat on it. I'm just going to come back here and just... So Susan, uh, mm -hmm. in a non-demonstration environment, you know, mm -hmm. working on, on that size of pastel, how, how long uh, would you typically work on that or at a time even? Um, it, it really depends. Uh, Sometimes the whole thing will come together in like an hour, right? Wow. Like it, it's actually a pretty fast medium. It's fabulous outside because you don't have to mix anything. So mm -hmm. I'm just giving I just a little bit more light. Um, sometimes you beat them to death and then you eventually, you know, kick them to the curb. But uh, normally uh, a pastel this size wouldn't take me more than an hour and a half at the most. Wow. They're pretty, they're pretty fast. One of the things I, I loved about pastels was just the fact that you have an endless, endless brush. So in acrylic yeah. or oil, you're constantly going back to the palette to pick up mm. some more paint, put it on the canvas, more paint, put it on the canvas. Whereas once you've picked up a pastel stick, you just Keep that's going. right it's great it's 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 such an immediate and i've always loved drawing like drawing's always been my first love um not painting and i just love drawing and and i love holding the tool in my hand and i love the immediacy of pastel i mean it's it's just it's a pain to, you know frame I'll, I'll admit to that i don't like framing them although you know i've gotten pretty adept at it but and and I just love the immediacy of, immediacy of it and I love how you can play with color in pastel it's uh, very satisfying for me anyway I just it's fun wow. what's the biggest one you've done it's size wise um I've done uh, 30 by 40 ones just about killed me broke the first wow. piece of glass trying to do it so there, there are a lot of there I find pastels a very intimate uh tool um and it lends itself to these smaller more intimate paintings uh when you you get it 
up to that size. I mean, there's some people out there that do incredible pastels that size, and I'm always in awe of them. But and I don't know how they handle them. I I guess I should, you know, I could probably contact some of the people that do these huge ocean ones. Like, what do you do with them? Like, once you've done them, what do you do with them? Because they're like three feet long and four feet long and two feet wide. They're these huge pastels. And I don't know how they frame them. You can't possibly work with glass that big. It, mm, you, twist it, you twist it a little bit. You can't spray these things so that you can get to get them to the point that you don't have to put something on them because they're just, they don't, it doesn't work like that. So I don't know what they do. I'm just gonna just, I just wanna make just one little. So there's a lot of pastel right there and I don't like that and I wanna get back down. So what I'm gonna do is I take bread and I kind of just smush it up so it's kind of tight and little. And I'm just gonna come in here and just, just do this, just this one little spot. There we go. Just, I took that pastel off because he, hims wasn't working right there. What? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just come back in. So I can get a little bit better load of pastel right there. There, that's better. And then come in around him with the, um, and I'm just gonna stick a little bit of just bright pink in here because it's going to vibrate and we want vibration so we'll come in with a little bit of that okay so you know, you have to step back and look at it and decide whether you like it or not. And then you take a little mat. We'll put a piece of tape on the back or we'll take a piece of tape here. Just give me a sec here. I'm all covered with dust, you know, so I'm not in very good uh, shape for handling this thing but it's just a little working mat so it won't matter <laughs> it won't matter <laughs> I need a funny okay okay so there we go there you go wow Wow, beautiful. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Wow. It's amazing how adding the mat, you know, it just cleans up those outside edges that are kind of messy otherwise. And all of a sudden it just pulls it all together for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is removable tape. So I can pull it off this mat. Not that this mat's going to have any life left in it after I've uh, <laughs> touched it and gotten it filthy. But there we go. It looks yeah. really beautiful. That is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's so, amazing how the light, how you've got the light coming through those trees. It's yeah, exactly. That's my favorite part. And that's, that's mm -hmm. what I focus on in my picture taking is I'm looking for, I'll just turn you around here. So you can, I can, yeah. Oh, okay. I know what I'll do. I'm gonna take you out of your little table holder. Take you up so you can see it a little closer. There. So there. Wow. There's some of the mark making. Wow when you get up close. It's just wow. gorgeous. Mm. Mm. Yeah. All right. Gorgeous. So, any questions? That was excellent. <laughs>
It was wonderful to watch you. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. So are, will you spray that now? No, I don't spray my pastels. Um, I don't like what um, most, the only spray I use is something called Lesco out of um, Switzerland. It's, they make a spray that actually doesn't hurt the painting. It's very good, but the Windsor & Newton just ruins pastels. S some of the sprays are awful. So I really suggest that if you can get away without using a uh, spray, do it. So what I do now is I'll take a piece of parchment paper, I'll put it over the surface and I'll take my rolling pin and give it a good press, okay? So first thing I'll do is I'll give it a shake after I take it off my board. Then I put parchment paper on it, very careful that I don't twist it or move it. And then I give it a roll. roll. Yeah, the roll with my rolling pin. And that kind of sets it. it. It gives it a, it helps press it into the paper. And then I either put glass right on top of it. Or if I'm putting it in a mat, what I do is on the inside of my mat, like here on the inside, I'll put a little spacer so it holds it off the pastel just a little bit. Mm. So if it decides to flake, which inevitably they do, the pastel goes behind the mat. Okay. Mark. And it works really well. Michael's actually carries a series of frames and I forget what they're called, but they work really well because they do put spacers between the top mat and the bottom mat. So if a little bit of pastel decides to fall off, it falls off between the two mats and doesn't seem to bother the bottom mat. So it works extremely well. So, hmm. just lost the mat on this. Okay. Hey. There we go. Are the ones behind you pastels or are they? Um, no, These, this is acrylic, 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 acrylic. This is oil actually. Um, there's some that are mixed media. Let's see, the only other pastel. Oh, this is a little, this is a little acrylic and pastel. It's mixed together. So it's an um, acrylic painting underneath and then it's uh, pastel on the surface. Um, that's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. That's another whole. <laughs> another lesson for another day. <laughs> another lesson. <laughs> another day but there's a that's a pastel I did of cows at dawn wow. oh wow. that's beautiful mm -hmm. wow. yeah if you wanted to see a lot of pastels that I do uh they're on my Instagram page they're really far back though like you have to go back about 400 paintings to find them <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there's quite a few in there they're just sort of scattered around because mm -hmm. uh I don't exclusively do pastel in fact, mm -hmm. I don't do as much pastel as I used to, mainly because I've just found it, it's really difficult. I send more pastels down to the States than I sell in Canada ever. Like mm -hmm. they go off to Colorado and New Hampshire and New York. But can I sell one in Western Canada? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. No. <laughs> And it wow. seems like it seems like even with your acrylics and oils and mixed media that you also do those on paper. Uh, I'll do a lot of work on paper. I like working on paper. I do. You know, I've got lots of canvas here, too. You know, I've got lots of canvas sitting here, like some really big canvases and lots of stuff. I've just got to show that I just mounted like, like these are. These are some of the, the acrylics that I do, like abstracted mm. is, okay. Mm. Oh. So that's, that's, that's one of them. Most of them are at the gallery now because I just rehung the gallery, but. Um, wow. Yeah, I work all different sizes. I mean, for galleries, most of them want the, like I've got a few, 36 by 36 and 36 by 72s hanging in the studio here that um, have to have to be taken down to Calgary really 
really soon here, but I love working on paper. I just like the surface of paper. Mm -hmm. I got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in love with that. Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't know. I just like paper. Well, I like hate you like but, you said, you, you started out by drawing, right? So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah. And I still, I still start all my paintings with drawings, very mm -hmm. loose abstracted drawings. And most of my pastels start with, you know, drawing sometimes. Uh, this one was just a, a value uh, sketch that I put in first, but do try the, um, uh, you know, the spritzer. If you don't like spritzing it, because it does get in the air just a little bit, is you can put some in a little bowl, you know, just pour some out of a, a bottle of isopropyl alcohol and just dip your brush and use it mm -hmm. too. It, it works just as well. It's just this is faster, you know, because you got, you can have this in one hand and your brush in the other and you can just be going like crazy. So it, it just uh, ex expedites or it, it, it makes it go faster, that's all. Um, cool. When you do your acrylic on paper, do you mount them on a board or what do you do with yourself? Uh, some of them, like this, this one's actually, I call these my icing paintings because this is, um, it started out as an acrylic and uh, no, it started out as a pastel, got some acrylic on it and then I finished it with oil. So it's got a little bit of everything. <laughs> wow. So I call these my icing paintings. So um, I'll send it. She's She'll handle the framing because it's going to Tennessee. So she's going to handle the framing. What I do, because sometimes they don't dry flat. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you see this has got to, all I do is I, I have a board, an MDF board, and I lay it down. And then I just wet the back, mm -hmm. sponge. Then I have some really heavy, it's a piece of MDF board that's an inch thick. It weighs a ton. And I have a very thin layer of foam on it. And I lay that on top and it dries everything really flat. It's from when I was doing a lot of monotype printmaking. Mm -hmm. And you had to flatten everything. And it works really well for, for you know, doing that up. But, yeah. But. Wow. Yeah. So mm -hmm. do you put the foam on, like the foam that's on the MDF board for that drying process, is that to make sure that it kind of um, absorbs any water evenly? Yeah, it just, it, what you do is you take your really thick piece of MDF board, you get a little thin, like my foam's about that thick, right? It's not a thick piece of foam, it's just a thin piece of foam. And then I took cheesecloth and I stapled it all the way around the edge of the foam so it holds it in place. And that's that's what I was taught how to do from the, um, the monotype instructor. Okay. And it just holds it. And it actually helps because sometimes even if you got something really heavy, it'll dry with a bit yeah. of a ripple, which is a real pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. But if you've got one, that little bit of foam, that thin little bit of foam stretched over the board, it seems to keep it from doing that mm. so yeah so the paper pieces some of them you know sometimes they don't need it they just they're okay and sometimes they do and with my acrylics I start them out very similar um, in the respect that I use the clear gesso mixed with a little bit of for this I'll use a transparent red oxide or a transparent yellow oxide like a nice transparent color that I put on the surface of the paper and then work on that. So mm -hmm. I always start with a nice uh, toned surface. And I love the clear gesso because it gives the paper a little bit of tooth. So if you're using acrylic, it grabs it differently than if you just put some matte medium on. Matte mm -hmm. medium, things slide on matte medium. On mm -hmm. the clear gesso, things pull. So you get a bit mm -hmm. different feel to the paint, which I find is, um, gives it a, a little bit more, the marks just hold a little bit better. So mm -hmm. I like that a lot. And, uh, and that's what I do. That's <laughs> that. Cool. Yeah. These, are, these are great tips. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm. Yes, that was great, Susan. Yeah, very interesting. Okay. Yeah. And pastels get 
dirty easy right they're they're just and they they're always in a state of disrepair so what i have found is that works the very best it's the bizarrest thing i'm not going to get it out before in there but my has, husband had this nut and bolt cleaner out in the garage and it's a, this thing that oscillates and vibrates you know really so i just put my rice flour in there and i dump a bunch of pastels and i put the lid on the thing goes like this and it turns around real fast and then you turn it off and all the pastels are perfectly clean and oh, it's, wow. just, wow. it's fast how clever is that <laughs> yes it, it's so and he only cleans bolts once in a blue moon whereas i clean pastels lots so, <laughs> I get, so it's yours now <laughs> it's mine. that's right he's not wow. getting it it's wow. mine he can go buy his <laughs> yeah so that's that's a that's a fun thing and uh, <laughs> So the rice flour, do you have to toss that after every cleaning or can you reuse it? No, it has to be tossed. Um, and you don't even have to use rice flour per se. I think that I have in there right now. What do I have in there? You know what works even better is just cornmeal. That's what I've got in there right now is cornmeal. Just, um, you know, just regular old, and it's cheaper. It's really cheap. Just get cornmeal, throw your pastels in there. You can even do it just, I mean, I've got this thing now, but I used to just take a, uh, let's say a, a large yogurt container and fill it half full of cornmeal, put your pastels in a little mesh bag that you got onions in, or, you know, mm -hmm. or what, yeah. little mesh bags, put a handful, make sure you put all the colors that are similar, like don't stick two black crayons in there with a bunch of pale, pale colors, but, you know, put all, all your mid-tones together and put them in there and just shake and then just take the little bag and you shake it out and all the stuff comes out and they're all clean so it's <laughs> wow. a great way to clean them it takes the agony out of taking everyone and cleaning it on a paper towel or something because that's <laughs> that's dreadful but, yeah. <laughs> great idea wow. but i wish i had more time yeah. i'd show you um uh, underpainting done with acrylic which is another really fabulous way to mm -hmm. explore the medium like there's lots of different things that i do with pastels or sometimes i do and mainly it's an acrylic painting and then just topped with a bit of pastel so it's a real mixed media and they're really fun to do too but this well, is probably one that's most useful and, we'll have and, to get and, you back yeah we sure. may. <laughs> anytime give you one last look the oh, mat lovely. already fell off that's lovely that um, is beautiful yeah it's beautiful and thank you for coming last minute that was uh lovely oh, and <laughs> you're ahead and you're hour ahead of us so you're probably going to be ready for bed before we are <laughs> oh it's 9 12 yeah no that's yeah. fine oh i'm <laughs> I'm I'm a bit of a night owl, so I won't yeah. be won't be heading that way for a bit. But uh, yeah, I'm actually this weekend. I'm gearing up. I'm doing a three a three day workshop for leading edge workshops this week this weekend, and then I start teaching for Penn Studios on uh, next Wednesday. Uh, I get to do it on Wednesdays. I get to pick whatever day I want, and it's out of Pittsburgh, and mm. I'm and abstracting the landscape class for them so uh that starts next wednesday which i'm looking forward to i've never taught for them before it'll be a, a quite an interesting experience they're actually this um i took a course from a, an artist by the name of mashul chowdhury um chowdhury is c-h-o-w-d-u-r-y chowdhury uh, mashul <laughs> m-a-s-h-u-i-l He's uh, an abstract painter, uh, oil, uh, teaches out of, he, t he lives in Pennsylvania. He's actually uh, a specialist in infectious diseases worldwide. Like he's quite, wow. quite an interesting man. And he's from, I think, Pakistan. And he's just a gentle, beautiful soul and an mm. absolutely fabulous um, abstract painter. And if you look him up, his figure drawing is blow your mind figure drawing. Like he's just the best. And mm -hmm. he taught for Penn Studios. And then 
out of the blue, they contacted me. So I don't know how they found me. <laughs> uh, I suspect that Marshall and I got hit it off mainly, I think, because we already were thinking a lot alike. So it was just sort of more of an affirmation. And it was it was wonderful just uh, watching him work. So uh, it's uh, it's a really they've got some great artists that are teaching for them all, all over, from all over the world, like wow. uh, everywhere, Canada, Scotland, Europe everywhere they're they're really lovely but well yeah well you're gonna have fun well thank you for coming and thank you for the amazing demo and good luck in your next oh um, i'm yeah well i've been doing i do a lot of zoom so i'm pretty pretty um what's the word uh, used to this format now and it's uh zoom savvy <laughs> i'm zoom savvy actually i started doing zoom when COVID first hit I was uh, scheduled to teach for Red Deer College I usually teach at the college here in the summertime uh, summerscapes and um, or series they call it series and uh, they gave me the option to go online and they gave me all the uh, tools I needed or taught me the tools I needed so and it worked really well so for mm -hmm. quite a while I was I was setting up and doing my own classes now I just do them for other people but mm -hmm. it, it 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 does open the world to the world and yeah. I still love teaching I just taught a workshop in Olds actually this weekend and I love being with people it's mm -hmm. lovely <laughs> stand over your shoulder and say mm. yeah you know? <laughs> but I've also, because of this, I've taught people in India. I've taught people in Australia, mm. Scotland, England. I've taught all over the world, which is, I think, the miracle of this. And I've had people say, well, I can't go to classes because I've got a really bad hip. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't negotiate the, the walking and the getting to the location. And mm -hmm. so it, it works for some people. Yeah. That, it's it's just another tool in the box right right cool yeah, yeah. okay well, if you come back to Kelowna to visit your friend we should maybe coordinate and get you here for a workshop sometime <laughs> yeah anytime that would be great we'll yeah. stay in touch yeah stay Thank in touch you. you can organize that I'm out there in I think when am I end of June I'm out there yeah, and then probably in September again when we come back from the island because my daughter lives in Nanaimo. So we kind of cool. use that. It's sort of, it's great because it's like seven hours to the ferry from Ronnie's house and then eight hours to Calgary or to Red Deer. Mm. So sort of like right in the middle and it just works out perfect. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone for coming. Lots of fun. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. We'll see you at the next meeting.